Hi there. My name is Colin Knapp, and I'm the senior pastor of Pilgrim Congregational Church. You have decided to join us for our worship service today, August 23rd. I'm glad that you are here. You are witnessing our new children's library space, which soon, hopefully soon, will once again be used by children. Pilgrim is a open and affirming congregation in the United Church of Christ. We gather together every week virtually for the past couple of months to worship God and to share the love of Jesus Christ and to put our faith into action. Thanks for being here. Welcome to Pilgrim Congregational Church's online worship service for August 23rd. My name is Jeff Petertill, and I will have the honor of being the liturgist today. Please join me in the responsive reading for today's call to worship. We are coming together in a time when we have been advised not to come together. We gather to worship. We are together to praise God and seek forgiveness of our sins. So often we have fallen short of what God would have us be, and yet we have been forgiven. How blessed we are that God forgives us and loves us. God makes us new in God's spirit. We joyfully accept the newness of life God offers to us. Come, let us worship and be thankful. Let us open our hearts to the peace and joy of God. Amen. Amen. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. Beloved Creator and Holy One, there is something going around that endangers our health, endangers our lives, and the lives of those around us. Some say it is in the air. Some say it is in our bodies. Some say it lies deeper. In such times, people gather to worship a God of love and mercy. It has been happening for centuries that people of humility, as we must always be, worship together to renew hope and give praise. In our faith, we pray for guidance. In your grace, we pray for forgiveness. Amen. Grace. 
God's beloved children, we are invited to come to our God with the fullness of our lives, to admit our love and our hate, to admit our faith and our fear. Trusting in God's mercy, let us make our confession. Revitalizing God, your power goes far beyond our own, and yet still we act as though the pains of this world have final claim upon us. We give in to the despair and hopelessness of fear, not trusting in your ability to do what seems impossible to us. Forgive us for doubting your power to raise up new life in the midst of all the deaths we experience. Forgive us for wanting to limit you, for not trusting you to move and act among us, within us, through us. Forgive us and open our eyes to the wonder of new life sprouting into being in our very midst. We ask for your help. We ask for your healing. We ask that you make us whole. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Even though the future is clouded, God is with us, guiding, healing, comforting, restoring. The peace of Christ surpasses our understanding. Receive it, celebrate it, and live into it with joy. Alleluia, amen. peace and love to all of my Pilgrim family. Please stay healthy. The world desperately needs peace right now. I pass the peace of Christ to each and every one of you. May the peace, peace of Christ, Christ be with you. We love our Pilgrims. Peace be with you, Pilgrim family. Good morning, friends. Peace to you today. This is June. Peace be with you now and always. Hello, fellow pilgrims. Guess who's looking at you? I miss you all, and my advice is no more hugging. I hope to see you in person very soon. Love you all. Peace be with you. Our first scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. I'll be reading verses 23 through 35. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. And then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. And then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you have not had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. 
This is a word of the Lord. Thanks be to This week we're continuing to explore the Lord's Prayer. And we're up to the line of, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgiveness is a hard word, isn't it? Not easy to do when someone hurts us, either our feelings or physically. It's not easy to forgive, is it? In the Bible, there's lots of stories about forgiveness. One of those Bible stories comes from the New Testament in Matthew. The disciple comes to Jesus and says to Jesus, how many times should I forgive someone for doing something? And the disciple says, how about seven, seven times? How about you at home? Does seven seem like a pretty fair time amount to forgive? Well, guess what Jesus says? Not only seven times, but seven times 70. Who at home knows how much seven times 70 is? I think I hear Henry saying to me that it's 490. 490 times. Is there something that you can do 490 times in a row? Can you do jumping jacks for 490 times? Jump up and down in the air for 90 times? Eat 490 Skittles in a row? 490 is a really big number. Do you think that's exactly what Jesus meant? That we should keep a tally that this is how many times I have forgiven and keep going? I don't think so. Do you think God keeps track of how many times that he has forgiven us? I hope not. In the story today, a man comes before the king and owes this huge giant debt. And he's begging and begging the king to let the debt go because if he doesn't, he'll have nothing left. Well, the king decides to forgive it and he grants forgiveness to him. Well, now the servant is very happy and leaves, but then it finds someone who owes them just a small amount of money. And he doesn't show this person the same forgiveness. He demands the money, and when the person doesn't have it, he has them thrown in jail. So that doesn't quite make sense, does it? Well, the king finds out about this, calls the servant back, and says, I forgave you, but you did not forgive them. And he threw them into jail. Now, there's some steps that we can take from this story. And there are these three simple steps. God loves us and gives freely of his love to us. And God also gives us forgiveness. So that's step one. In step two, we take God's love and we put it into our hearts. And we take the forgiveness that God has given to us. And we hold it dearly in our heart with his love. But then there's a third step that that servant didn't take. Taking God's love and sharing it with others. And showing that same forgiveness for someone else. Forgiving someone doesn't mean that we're not angry about what happened. Or saying that it's okay what they did to us. Forgiving is taking that anger because we have God's love and giving that over to God and letting God take care of the problem. It's letting that go from our shoulders, our hearts, our minds, and giving it over to God. And that's how debts and debtors work. We're going to end today with the prayer that we've been learning with the motions. I'll do it for you, and then you'll follow along with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day 
our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Amen. Our second scripture reading also comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. This is a word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. As I began to write this sermon, I found myself reflecting upon the implications of these words, these words we say every week. I felt as if I were standing at the edge of an abyss, looking out over the edge into the sheer chasm that lies between the casual way in which we recite these words week in and week out and their actual meaning. Maybe they're words we don't mean. Maybe we just say them because we think we should or because they were taught to us by our parents or a beloved Sunday school teacher. In any manner, there seems to me to be a divorce between our utterances and their implications. Because the truth is, to pray, forgive us as we forgive, is unsettling. This continual process of being unsettled is central to what it means to be a Christian, to engage with God on a journey that is both about us as individual people and ultimately not really about merely myself. Talking about forgiveness is unsettling. And so I want to begin today by laying out some things that forgiveness is and some things that forgiveness is most certainly not. Now, to be clear, I am not an expert in forgiveness. I am just a person who has been wounded and hurt like all of you. And just like all of you, I have also heard Jesus' call to forgive and to practice reconciliation. And so I do not want to minimize the very real pain that I know so many of us have felt and do feel. So I'm not going to stand up here and preach to you about what forgiveness looks like exactly in every circumstance. And if you just practice these eight easy steps, then this whole forgiveness business is really rather easy. Because that isn't helpful or even true. But I do know the parameters of Christian forgiveness. Forgiveness is not easy or simple. It is not covering up your feelings or approving of or tolerating the wrong that was done to you. It is not a sign of weakness or excusing the person who hurt you. Forgiveness is not inviting someone to hurt you again. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not a one-time event, but one that must be practiced again and again and again. It is a never-ending practice. Forgiveness is not a solitary act. It happens in community with other people. If you were to read the verses right before our pericope in Matthew 18, you would see Peter's concern is how people in the church, in an intimate community can practice forgiveness 
on a continual basis. It is not isolated, individual work. It is hard work. Forgiveness is acknowledging your feelings of pain and hurt and sadness. It's naming the wrong that was done to you and holding the other person accountable for what they did. Forgiveness is overcoming fear and shame and blame. Forgiveness is about taking steps towards health and wholeness and declaring a hope that tomorrow things will be just a bit better. And yes, forgiveness is a process that can take a very, very long time. The forgiveness that we pray for, the forgiveness that Jesus speaks of, it's about truth-telling. It's not simple or easy. It is hard. But it's also a great gift to us because it helps us to remember that we are human, that we are finite creatures with limited abilities, and we need help. So to pray this prayer, to practice forgiveness as Christ commands, we cannot do so alone. We need God's help. The parable from Matthew's gospel is instructive here. There are many different words that we use for exactly what we are being forgiven of. Trespasses, debts, sins. They all convey slightly different meanings. They portray forgiveness in different ways. And the parable today helps us to understand forgiveness through the metaphor and language of debt. And so the parable goes that a king had many servants with whom he wished to settle his accounts. There was one servant who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, in the first century, a talent of silver weighed approximately 85 pounds, and it corresponded roughly to half a year's wages for the common day laborer. So to owe 10,000 talents is an immense amount of money. It's a number so large that it's really kind of hard to wrap your head around. If you wanted to pay it back, it would only take you 5,000 years. In other words, it is a debt that cannot be repaid, ever. Jesus here is speaking in hyperbole. The whole parable is actually a hyperbole. I want you to realize that. Jesus does so to get our attention. And so regardless of the size, or perhaps precisely because of it, the servant's debt is forgiven by the king. Now, this forgiven servant also happens to have a servant of his own. His servant owes him money too, but a much more reasonable amount, a hundred denarii. A hundred denarii is roughly three months' wages. So take your last paycheck... Remember that number? Multiply it times six. It's about that much money. Not an insignificant amount, to be sure, but a debt that could be reasonably paid back over time and minuscule compared to 10,000 talents. However, while the first servant received mercy and his debt was forgiven, he did not extend that forgiveness to his servant. His burden was lightened, yet he refused to relieve his servant of the same. So, what's really happening here in this parable? In my estimation, the servant fails to extend forgiveness because the servant is, at his core, or her, or her core, ungrateful. The unforgiving servant has a profound blindness. 
It is to take life for granted, to take the power of forgiveness lightly, to show little regard for the tremendous debt that was forgiven without merit or cause, but simply out of the goodness of the king's heart. The servant fails to recognize his debt, fails to see his own desperate condition, fails to see the king's undue offer of forgiveness, and therefore cannot live into the joy and freedom of being forgiven. When we pray, forgive us as we forgive others, it's really, really important that we have some concept, some personal experience of the freedom that forgiveness brings. That we come to understand the sheer magnitude of God's forgiveness and grace for each one of us. That forgiveness that always comes before we even ask or pray these words aloud. Because it is that freedom, that joy, that peace that enables and empowers us to extend forgiveness towards someone else who has hurt us. It's the shared common experience, the recognition that neither I nor my sister or brother can be free under the alienating debt of our transgressions. And so, as we confess our own desire to be free, we also simultaneously renounce our neighbor's debt to us, so that both of us can have the same freedom and peace that we seek from God. God does not merely forgive us. God empowers us to be agents of forgiveness. I am reminded here of the work of an organization called Rest in Peace Medical Debt. They buy large amounts of medical debt for pennies on the dollar, and then they send out letters to folks letting them know that their medical bills have been forgiven. One church in Michigan last year raised a mere $15,000 and wiped out almost $2 million in medical debt. A woman named Sarah Cook was one of their recipients. At first, Sarah thought the letter in the yellow envelope had to be a scam or some kind of cruel joke. We are pleased to inform you that you no longer owe the balance on the debt referenced above, it read. Our forgiveness of the amount you owe is a no-strings-attached gift. Eight back surgeries and more than two dozen hospital visits in the span of three years had saddled Sarah, who was only 43 years old, with stacks of medical bills that she struggled to pay each month. She had been working as a nurse when she first sought treatment for a herniated disc in her back. That herniated disc led to an infection that turned into meningitis that left her with unpredictable seizures. She became unable to drive or walk without a cane. By August of last year, when the letter arrived, two years had passed since Sarah had received a paycheck. The yellow envelope had been mailed to her old house, the one where she had lived before it became impossible to pay the rent. She was effectively homeless. Having her debt forgiven reinforced her belief that God would provide for her. And it showed her that any act of forgiveness, no matter the size, could alter her perspective on life forever. She says it like this. That was something that someone did for me when they didn't even know me. 
out of the kindness of their hearts, you don't know how much of a difference that makes. What is it to feel the wonder of true forgiveness? To hear God speak gently about your future when you were so sure it was going to be only a denouncing rebuke about your past? To bask in the glow of God's redemptive love for you when you thought only condemnation awaited. To have resigned yourself to darkness only to be brought into a marvelous light. To live for so long with shame and guilt and regret and what ifs. You can't even remember what it feels like to look yourself in the mirror with a sense of confidence and pride. And one day, God breaks those chains. God breaks those chains and sets you free. This is forgiveness. This is resurrection. This is the gospel. May it be so for you. Amen. I invite you now to join me in prayer. You are welcome to share your prayer joys and concerns online during this service in the chat, submit them through our website, or contact a deacon for healing prayer by phone. Please pray with me. Lord God, we praise you. We give you thanks because you are good, because your faithful love lasts forever. You never leave your people alone. So we pray for the people on our hearts who are in need. We pray for those who are sick, for those who suffer or struggle, for those who grieve, and especially for those who are lonely or hopeless. We pray for those we have lifted up by name. Christine's brother Richard, who is recovering from his second surgery in a month, Mary's son-in-law, David, a diabetic recovering from a surgery, and Mary's sister, Rosemary, and her family. Harriet's sister, Karen, who is growing in confidence and a sense of belonging in her new home. Marcella's youngest son, Brandon, and all of the college students returning to school this fall. Keep them safe, keep them healthy. The grieving families of Bob Russo, 
Oralee Booker, Robert Trump, Lindsey Stevens, and all who have recently lost loved ones. Oh Lord, we put our hope in you. God, we pray for healing of brokenness as we grieve the loss of life, of businesses, of your natural world. We lift up the people in Iowa where tornadoes have changed lives forever and have demolished the livelihood of so many. We ask for your presence to be off the coast of the Republic of Mauritius, where an oil spill has damaged your beautiful creation. We pray for courage and resiliency for those facing wildfires in California, especially for those in danger's path and those who are suffering renewed trauma because of losses suffered in previous years. O oh Lord, we put our hope in you. We pray this day for the nations of this world and for our leaders that they may have the gifts of discernment and courage. Give them wisdom to seek the good of all, not only some. Guide them to lead with integrity, compassion, imagination, and love. Grant them the courage to do what is just and right for the benefit of the many, not just the few. O oh Lord, we put our hope in you. Father, Mother, God, we pray for congregations such as ours who are discerning how to be faithful to your calling in these tumultuous times. Help us to remember your high calling to us to be agents of forgiveness and reconciliation, love and peace, healing and hope in a world made dark by fear and hatred and brokenness. We trust that you do not abandon us when the going gets rough. Rather, you walk alongside us as a friend and hold our hand as a loving parent to guide us in the path of faithfulness. O oh Lord, we put our hope in you. Gather us into your love as individuals and as one body through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our setters. And let us not, indeed us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is a time in our worship when we lift up our offerings. Now we have several options by which you can support Pilgrim with your financial contributions. You're invited to give to Pilgrim Church using any of these methods online, at www.pilgrimoakpark.org. Select giving from the menu or click the Give to Pilgrim button via the Tithely app downloaded from your phone's app store or text the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, to 833-721-1098. Or, of course, you can always mail a check. We always ask that you give as generously as you are able, and now that is even more important as the financial circumstances of the church and some of our members have been negatively impacted by the economic downturn. Pilgrim is receiving significantly less money from fundraisers such as Farmer's Market Donuts and Building and Space Rentals. Some members have seen work changes that have reduced their income. Others may have found that budget expenses for travel and other activities have been curtailed and they now actually have more savings and more ability to contribute to the church. It was decided at the congregational planning meeting via Zoom last month that it would be helpful to know more about our members' changing circumstances. If you were among those who made a pledge or other commitment 
to 2020, last winter, you will have received a letter envelope mailed August 15th via the United States Postal Service. It contained a summary of your giving for the first six months and a page with an important message from the chairs of two of our committees, finance and stewardship. At the bottom of that page is a place to indicate how you now assess your 2020 pledge. You are asked to check the box that is most relevant to your financial situation. Then please sign it anywhere on the document so they have your name and return it in the stamped envelope, such as this, addressed back to the church. We are always grateful for your offerings. Benevolent God, we dedicate our offerings to your work and ourselves to your service. Amen. And now I have several announcements to share with you for the good of the community. Are police operations a mystery to you? What is meant by defunding the police? Are police unions a problem or a solution? For an insider's view, the Be Bold, White Privilege, and Standing with Others group invites you to register for a very special Zoom presentation, Police Operations, Practices, and Racism. Our guest presenter is Andre Watkins. The presentation is August 26th, but you need to pre-register. More information is available on the website. Friday evening, August 28th, you are invited to join us for worship on the lawn in the glow of God's love. 7.45 p.m. to 8.15.
It will be a time of scripture, meditation, and music, but spaces are limited to 20, so please RSVP as soon as possible to maureen.dale at pilgrimoakpark.org or give her a call to reserve your spot. We're looking for woodworking volunteers to help build a little free pantry building based on the model of the little free libraries that you may have seen around Oak Park. If you're able to help, please contact our moderator, Debbie Kent. And we really, really enjoy seeing so many of you during the passing of the piece each week. Please keep sending those videos to Delina. Pilgrim has purchased 10 Black Lives Matter yard signs and invites individual pilgrims to purchase them for your own use. The cost is $15. And please see Lisa Milam or your What's Happening at Pilgrim email for more information. Immediately following worship today, you are all invited to join us for a virtual fellowship hour on Zoom. And now I invite you to join me in singing our closing hymn.
we are all ministers of God. We all sing unto the Lord. And we don't care how we sound. But it sounds sweet when it gets to his ears. So I want you to sing it with me now. Ready? Lord, prepare it. Lord, prepare me. My sisters and brothers, receive this benediction. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. You are beloved and forgiven, and you are called to be agents of reconciliation in this world. Go in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>